माते मत अंग जरे जर संग अनूप उतंग सुरंग सवारे कोट तुरंग कुरंग से कूदत पौन के गौन को जात निवारे पहाड़ी पुजान के भूख पहली बद न्यावत सी स्नान जात विचारे इते भय तो कहां भय पूपत अंत को नांग ही पाए पधारे Welcome to lesson number five of the United Sikh Movement's Volume Three Gurbani Study Course on Dasambani. So today, lesson five, we finished Job Sahib last week, or at least the portions of Job Sahib that we chose to cover. And this week, we're starting a brand new bani named Akal Ustat. Akal Ustat literally means the praise of the timeless one. The timeless one, of course, meaning God. But within Akal Ustad, there are 10 stanzas called the Toprasad Saveye that are considered a nickname Barni for six. So these 10 stanzas, they, they go chronologically, they, they're together in Akal Ustad. These 10 are considered a nickname Barni that a Sikh is supposed to read or listen to every single day. And these 10 stanzas, these Saveye are also read while Amrit is being prepared in the Amrit Sanjar ceremony. So these, uh, these lines are also considered Amrit Bani. And also many people refer to these Saveye also as Amrit Saveye because they are used, as I just said, to make Amrit. So there are 10 stanzas. Of course, you know, there, there's, that's too long for the length of our curriculum, unfortunately. So we picked two of the stanzas to go over. We're going over the second stanza today and we're going over the, the ninth stanza next week. So with that, let's go straight into stanza number two. So the whole focus of this stanza, there, there are four lines in each stanza. The whole focus of this stanza is to talk about the idea of pride and arrogance that many people have. Of course, they had it back then. We definitely have it here today as well. You know, human characteristics don't change over time. People were prideful back then, they're prideful now. So, you know, one of the greater themes of Gurbani study is kind of reminding everyone that Gurbani is still extremely relevant today as it was back then. These lines were written hundreds of years ago by Guru Gobind Singh Ji. They're revealed to God hundreds of years, revealed by God to the Guru hundreds of years ago. And yet, they're, as you're going to find out, they are extremely relevant to life today in uh, 2019. So let's go over these lines right now and make those connections to how we can apply them to our lives today. So the first line here is talking about, it's beginning to describe this, this very powerful king, you know, this very far, powerful and rich king. So Guru Gobind Singh Ji is saying, all right, let's imagine this king who has these intoxicated elephants not only these these elephants but elephants that have these 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 gold studs on them they're so beautiful remember at this time having an elephant in your army was considered a very very powerful um, object and you know imagine an elephant's like a tank like an old tank what they would do is they would take elephants they would intoxicate them with alcohol or drugs and when the elephant would become intoxicated, they would let the elephant loose to trample over the opposing army. Now, I'm guessing the majority of us have seen elephants in the zoo. You know, they're massive creatures. So when they go crazy because of, because of the intoxicants, they run wild and they, stay, they just run over the opposing enemy. And the enemy can't do anything about it. You know, taking a sword or bow and arrow really is not going to bring down an elephant. So only very rich kings, powerful kings could afford to have these elephants in their army. So this, this king is not only one that can have elephants, but he can put gold on his elephants. That's how powerful and rich this king is that the Guru is describing. And the next line, not only does he have kings, but he has thousands of horses that can gallop faster than the wind. So he has a strong cavalry as well. So he's not just a bunch of foot soldiers with you know little weapons. He has elephants. He has horseback soldiers that can move so quickly. So this is a very, very powerful king who has a lot of prestige. So we're not talking about one random person, but really a very powerful leader in, in this area. 
And in the next line, Guru Gobind Singh Ji says that not only does he have a powerful army, but all of these old and, and powerful kings and other leaders bowed their head to this king. That's how powerful he is that other kings bowed their head to this king here. And not only other kings, but older kings. You know, in South Asian culture, generally older people don't bow their head in respect to younger people. It's the opposite. The younger one goes to get the blessings of the older person. But here, Guru Gobind Singh is writing that this king is so powerful that even older kings, older leaders, bow their head in respect to this supposedly younger king. That's how powerful he is. Um, you cannot compare him to any other king. That's how Guru Gobind Singh is describing him. So where is the Guru going with this? We find this out in the fourth, stand, fourth line, excuse me. So Guru Gobind Singh Ji writes that even if one becomes such a powerful emperor, such a powerful king, the king will still depart with bare feet. And what does that mean? It means that at the end of the day, when this king physically leaves this world, he's not going to get any special treatment when it comes to meeting with God. He goes in line with every other person who also leaves this world, whether it's a, a, a laborer, you know, a carpenter, a doctor, a, um, a truck driver, a, a whoever it may be, they all go to the same place after they leave this world. There is no special place for kings and another place for, uh, you know, dentists. Everyone ends up in the same place. He goes with bare feet meaning he doesn't get to ride his elephants or his horses like he did throughout his life, but rather he has to go in bare feet just like every other person in this world. So what is a Guru saying? The guru is saying even if you have all of this massive wealth in your life, you have all of this power and prestige and money and soldiers, that at the end of the day, if you have not fallen in love with God, if you have not worshiped God, none of this matters. God is not impressed with your horses and elephants and your riches and your prestige and your arrogance and pride. He is not intimidated by that like other human beings are. He is not trying to get any favors from you like other human beings are. But rather, he looks at everyone equally. So this person who has accumulated all of this wealth basically wasted his or her time because they did not focus on the one true purpose of life, which is to get closer to God. They focused their entire life on accumulating money, wealth, power, and prestige. So God is not impressed by that at all. He, he judges and treats everyone the same in his court. So unlike here in this world, you know, if someone's rich or is politically connected, they get favors all of the time, right? They, they get special treatment. They don't have to stand in line. They don't have to go through all this red tape. They get, they get special treatment in this world. But there's no such special treatment when it comes to God's court. It doesn't matter how powerful you were in this earth. In his court, everyone's equal and no one gets any special treatment. So therefore, focus on accumulating spiritual wealth right now. Don't put all of your focus on material wealth. And why is that? Because you can't take that with you when you go meet God. You cannot take that, those, those gold pieces and those elephants and horses and take those with you to ride into God's court. No, you go, you go with bare feet. And what the Guru is saying, he's not saying that we shouldn't, you know, try to be successful. He's definitely not saying that. But what he's saying is to have balance in our life. So if, if, if there's a person that is focusing 99% of his or her life on just accumulating material wealth, that is their only focus in this world, they fall in line with the king being described here, which is not a healthy balance. So instead, the Guru suggests that as a Sikh, we should have a healthy balance of, of course, being successful in our careers, trying to accumulate material wealth honestly, giving back some of that wealth to help, you know, the Bunt and other people that need it as well, no matter where they come from. Balance is extremely important to have time to do seva, to have time for our nickname, to do kirtan, listen to kirtan, to do everything a Sikh is supposed to do while still being successful in their career. So the Guru is saying, have balance in your life because you cannot take all of this wealth with you. 
So as a result, why spend all of your time focusing on something that at the end of the day is not going to have any impact in where you go after you die? And this is not a concept that is just something Guru Gobind Singh Ji has said, but rather Guru Nanak Dev Ji and every Guru after has also reiterated this idea. There's a very famous Sakhi with Guru Nanak Dev Ji called the Sakhi with Duni Chand, in which Guru Nanak Sahib meets this very wealthy individual named Duni Chand. And he is very proud of this massive amount of wealth that he has accumulated during his life. He's very proud of the money he has. And he meets Guru Nanak and Guru Nanak can already tell what a big ego this person has because of how much money they have. And Guru Nanak wants to teach him a lesson similar to the one Guru Gobind Singh Ji writes here. So what Guru Nanak Sahib does is, you know, he talks to Duni Chand. Duni Chand brags about how much money he has, how much people look up to him, they suck up to him. He's so powerful because of his wealth. And Guru Nanak says, okay, I'm going to ask you a favor. You know, and he hands Duni Chand a needle, a needle. And he says, can you do me a favor? Please take this needle and give it to me in the next world. So after you pass away, and when I meet you there at some point, or if I go there first, hand me this needle, you know, when, when, when we meet in that next place. And Duni Chan said, well, what are, what are you saying? I, I can't do that. You know, when I die, I can't take this needle with me. You know, I just, you know, I don't even take my body. Like, I'm, you know, everything stays here. And Guru Nanak says, of course, everything stays here. So if you think, if you can't imagine taking this needle with you, this small little needle with you to the next world, how do you think you're gonna take all of your massive amounts of gold and jewelry and everything else, you know, your land, your houses, how are you gonna take all of that with you to the next world if you can't even take this little needle? And then Duni Chand realized what Guru Nanak was saying. The idea that all of your wealth, your power, your prestige, your reputation, all of that gets left behind in this world. And then you go into the next world, as Guru Gobind Singh Ji says, with bare feet, you know, with, with, with empty hands. You don't have anything physical with you. You don't have your gold. You don't have your fancy car or your fancy laptop or anything like that. You just have whatever spiritual deeds you have accumulated during your lifetime. That's what you take with you, not any material items. So Guru Gobind Singh Ji says here, focus on your spiritual life, focus on accumulating spiritual wealth, you know, becoming a better Sikh, a better human being, because that is what will take you in the next world. That is what comes with you not how much money is in your bank account or how many cars you own or how big your house is. And at the end of the day, the Guru reminds us that, you know what? There have been many, many wealthy people in this world. Imagine since the dawn of time to present day, there have been millions of rich people, millions of kings, millions of emperors, millions of world leaders. At the end of the day, they all left this world and left their wealth behind. No one could take it with them. So even if you are someone that is extremely wealthy, extremely powerful, that doesn't make you that special in this world. There have been millions like you before and there'll be millions like you after. But someone that is special is someone that has reached God, that has reached spiritual enlightenment because those people are very few in number since the dawn of time. That is truly exceptional. Making a lot of money and being powerful, millions have done it before, millions will do it after. And again, that's not to discourage anyone from trying to accumulate wealth, but rather the Guru is saying to have balance in your life. Because at the end of the day, the wealth you accumulate does not go with you. So as a result, focus on the items Focus on the tasks, focus on the values that will bring you wealth in your next life when you have your face-to-face -face with, with God after leaving this world. How much seva you do, whether you keep rehat, whether you do your nitname, whether you treat people well, whether, whether you treat people with equality, whether you are kind and compassionate. Those are the questions, those are the values and actions that matter and will go with you. Not how much money you have, not how powerful you are, not how much people fear you or respect you in this world. So with that, 
we will end the discussion on this uh, stanza of the Prasad Saveye, and next week we will continue our discussion of this Barney and go over the ninth stanza. And with that, I will see you next week. Vai Grujika Khalsa, Vai Grujiki Fateh.